rotating and eventually disintegrating rapidly during a single hot summer. Now, these ice shelves are important. You know that if you put some ice cubes in your Coke and you measure the level and you melt your ice cubes, the level of your Coke in your glass will not change. If you don't know that, go home and do it tonight. Have make yourself a glass of Coke, put an ice cube in, check the level, melt your ice cube, check the level, the level of the Coke will be the same. The fact that these ice shelves are melting means that they do not contribute directly to sea level rise. What these ice shelves do do is they hold back the glaciers on the land. They provide resistive, they resist ice flow. They provide resistive stresses to ice that is grounded on the Antarctic Peninsula. So when you collapse your ice shelves, you change the boundary conditions of your glaciers, and your glaciers accelerate, they thin, they flow into the ocean, and they do directly contribute to sea level rise. Do you understand that concept? Could you explain? Oh, sorry. Go, do, yeah. Do you, yeah, do you explain that again? So these ice shelves, when they're here, and it's, this last and was here for 10,000 years before it collapsed, this ice shelf holds back these glaciers on the spine of mountains on the Antarctic Peninsula. Yeah? Yeah. When you remove the ice shelf, you've taken away that resistive pressure. And the ice, as a result, has, it becomes unstable, and it, it accelerates, and it carves more icebergs into the ocean. And that does directly contribute to sea level rise. So does it kind of act like a buffer? It acts exactly like a buffer. The way we often use it is a buttress. These ice shelves buttress glaciers on land. When you remove the ice shelf, you are no longer providing that buttressing ability of the ice shelf. And it's not just the ice shelves that are changing. 87% of glaciers on the Antarctic Peninsula are receding. All these black dots are glaciers that are receding, and all these black dots are glaciers that are advancing. So the majority of glaciers, almost all of them, are shrinking. They're retreating on the Antarctic Peninsula. And these glaciers are directly contributing to sea level rise. So what were the earliest observations? So it depends what you mean by a direct observation. So the first observations of ice shelves and ice fronts date from uh, around, the, around the 30s, actually. It, from the first, the first exploration of Antarctica pre-World War II. Uh, Antarctica was a key location because it's, uh, if you do doing history, you'll know more about this than me. There's a narrow gap between Antarctica and Patagonia. This is a key strategic uh, key strategic locations, so we started exploring Antarctica around then in the 40s, and that's when our earliest ship-based observations extend from. But we have longer records than that because we can use proxy records from marine sediment cores to extend back our understanding of ice point. Because of these changes, glaciers in Antarctica are flowing faster. So, this, this map shows the rates of thinning, uh, and thinning is related, this is dynamic thinning, so it's thinning because the ice is accelerating. And we see the biggest change around this place in West Antarctica called, called Pine Island Glacier, which is just here, it's Pine Island Glacier, you see it's big red. The ice shelf that buttresses in Pine Island Glacier is thinning, and as a result it has a reduced buttressing capability. The Pine Island Glacier is accelerating and it's thinning. And that's really concerning because if you remember back to that map about uh, bed topography of the ice sheet, Pine Island Glacier is a, is a big ice stream that is in the marine based sector of Antarctica. Pine Island Glacier alone has a sea level equivalent of 1.5 metres. If Pine Island Glacier retreated, sea levels would rise 1.5 metres. And we're already seeing dynamic recession of pine island glacier. So this plateau is already shrinking back. Pine island glacier and its and the Swakes glacier, which is which is next to it, together have the largest negative mass balance in Antarctica. We're seeing really rapid changes in these ice streams. And it's being argued by a number of people, Eric Rigno included, that these 
ice streams are already in the early phases of marine ice sheet instability. These ice streams are already receding in an unstable manner. And they're expecting collapse to occur irreversible. Irreversible collapse is underway in Pine Island Glacier because that ground of land has retreated back onto that reverse bed slope. Irreversible collapse is considered inevitable. And this is a picture of Pine Island Glacier to hopefully draw things together. We've got circumpolar deep water upwelling, penetrating down onto the continental shelf edge a melting pine island glacier and it's moved back off that ridge now. It's now a location of three and it's on this reverse bed so we're seeing rapid thinning recession of pine island glacier. Right, so I haven't done too much talking now, so it's your turn. So we're going to have a bit of an interactive game. So I need some volunteers to come up from the audience, so perhaps, perhaps your teacher would like to come first. <laughs> we are our fallen hero. Wonderful, right? If you could be Pine Island Glacier and stand here. Excellent. And now I need if you could be my usher. Now you're supporting her, you're buttressing her, so I need you to support. Okay, there we go. Okay, and now I need to so glad this is on video. I need an accomplice. Hang on, it's not quite on video. Now it is. I need you to be an accomplice. Now Pine Island Glacier is quite heavy, so you're tilted down and like this. No, you're here. Come here. How do you hear that? Like Okay. And I now need some surface cold. Could you be my cold surface water? So stand here like this. Cold surface water. Like this. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. I need a villain. Will you be my villain? <laughs> <laughs> You're deep warm water, so you're surfing hello deep water. You're crouched down like this and you're deep and you've got warm, warm, melty fingers. Wonderful. Right, now you can't see this because they're in front of it, but I need some wind. Could you be my wind? Be my wind, if you could come up here for me. Be my wind. Oh, gosh. Right. <laughs> okay. Now, the rest of you don't get away with it. The rest of you are the ocean, okay? And when Pine Island Glacier melts, I need you to raise your arms for the rising sea level, okay? <laughs> you got it? Okay, so what's happening is... The gradients are changing and the wind is becoming stronger. This deflects the surface ocean currents. The circumpolar deep water rises up and it rises, it comes, rise, rise, <laughs> and it goes down the continental shelf and it melts the glacier, melts, melts, the pine island glacier accelerates and advances and beats. And the sea level rises. Well done, very well done. Well done
And it's critical for these kinds of reasons. Here we have 2,000 years worth of greenhouse gas emissions. They're increasing quite rapidly. And if we go to the year 2000, as a result of this increase in greenhouse gases, we've seen increases in sea level. But the future is uncertain. We find it very difficult to constrain these ice dynamical mechanisms, processes like marine ice sheet instability, processes like ice shelf collapse, are not currently included in IPCC forecasts of sea level rise. They're considered too difficult. This is a statement from the IPCC. It is uncertain whether ice dynamical mechanisms could enhance ice discharge sufficiently to have an appreciable effect on sea level rise. That's from the 2007 AR4. We're only now just beginning to be able to answer this question. We still have a lot of uncertainty, as shown by this image, in rates and magnitudes of change, which makes it difficult to predict future sea level rise, which makes it difficult to adapt to sea level rise. So we want to answer these questions to be able to narrow down a range of projections, provide more certain projections for the next 200 years. This is where I'm doing my place for research and touch. This is me, and my colleague Mike. This is George the Sixth I shot behind us. I'm going to talk about a project which is largely wrapped up now, which I did on the Northern Antarctic Peninsula. And we were looking at the glacial history of the Northeast Antarctic Peninsula over centennial to millennial timescales. So we we're interested in how the ice sheets behaved not only over the last few hundred years, but how it's behaved over the last few thousand years. We went to Antarctica, to James Ross Island. I used a number of techniques like remote sensing, so that's analysis of satellite images. Have any of you seen satellite images? Do you have any DJI yet? You do? Excellent. Right, well I do that a lot. Remote sensing of satellite images. And then I went into the field and ground truth that geomorphological mapping in the field. And I did something called cosmogenic nuclei dating, which is uh, where I can uh, take a rock sample and analyse the rock sample to find out how long that rock's been exposed to the atmosphere. A numerical modelling, so using computer programmes to test my answers. We got around on the quad bike, this is my quad bike, my wheel fell off. It was a bit of a disaster. We, we did get out. Um, there wasn't a fun day. And this is the kind of food that you eat in the fields. So this is a man food box, this is two men uh, for ten days. They're called man food boxes, not people boxes, do not get me started. Um, <laughs> So we've got porridge, we've got powdered milk here. Every Arctic explorer needs to have a bowl of Nido on their, on their desk to hold their pens in. Tracy you've got, you know, you know like status in the community. <laughs> uh, dehydrated food here, we've got some dried onions, don't eat them. Dried peas, uh, alpin is, is, is good. It's tea bags, it's hot chocolate, stuff like that. So that's what we, eat. That's what we survived on for uh, all our time in the field. This is our study area, so this is the Antarctic Peninsula, we've looked at lots of maps of that, and we're right at the northern tip. And the reason why it's interesting is because it's one of the largest ice-free areas from Antarctica, and so it provides a long terrestrial record of ice sheet dynamics in Antarctica. So we were interested in this area here, the Illu Peninsula, because it is this large ice-free area. Now it's an interesting area because you've got the Trinity Peninsula, the northern part of the Antarctic Peninsula, and the exposed bedrock here is all granite, granite and ice. Okay, so igneous, igneous bedrock. You know granite and ice? You know what I mean when I talk about granite and ice? So igneous be bedrock, so plutons of magma that have solidified and have large crystals. Whereas on James Ross Island, it's largely Cretaceous. So it's sandstones, flagstones with fossils in Things like um, ammonites. Uh, and I have a fossil lobster from him, which is cool. Uh, and also fossil wood, strangely. But uh, so you have different, very different geologies. Okay, so you've got granite over here and sandstone over here. And that's really interesting because if you find granite on the Illyrian Peninsula, you know that it's not local. And the only way it can have got there is by the ice crossing this deep Prince Gustav Channel coming directly across here. Prince Gustav Channel is aligned like this, it's a fault activated channel and it was exploited by ice streams during the last glacial maximum. We know that because it has these metascale glacial lineations at its base. They've been mapped, they're elongated ridges 
that are typical of ice streams. So this was a focus for ice stream during the last eight or cycle. This is Ulla Pinter. We were camped by this little lake here, and we went all around this area. We spent seven weeks there. This is my team. This is my boss. This is my colleagues. And we have this nice campsite here. It's a lookalike peaks. Uh, smiley, Cl smiley Cliffs nearby, named after one of our team, not here with us, called Smiley, John Smiley. It looked sunny there, but it wasn't always very pleasant. We had at least a week of light up, but we couldn't leave the tent uh, due to storms. You know, you can see that you can see very far, you're going to get lost very easily, so it's quite dangerous to go outside your tent. So we got very good at top trumps. Um, there's no electricity, really, so you can't really do much else other than play card games. So, uh, snap. <laughs> um, read, read a lot of books. Um, that's, that's about all you can really do. Um, so yeah, so we're there for about seven weeks. We, haven't, we don't really have much contact with the outside world. I don't know if you can quite pick it out, but there is a radio antenna there, which means that we can radio Rothera. Rothera is the British base. It's about 200 miles away from this field site. Uh, they are our closest human contact. And if we got into trouble, they would come and try and get us out. So if someone broke a leg or something like that, they would be who would evacuate us. 200 miles though, it's quite far, so uh, pretty, pretty isolated room. You certainly can't call home. <laughs> and the first thing we wanted to do was to look for evidence for overriding of the main Antarctic principle ice sheet during the last phase of maximum. And we found several characteristic features of, uh, of this. Uh, so, for example, we found erratics. So here we have basalt, which is black, distributed, scattered over a Cretaceous sandstone surface. It's a nice periglacial stone stripes here. They're, they're periglacial, but you can still see you've got basalt erratics on a, on a sandstone surface. And here is a granite. Non-local, this granite has come from the Antarctic Peninsula. It's been deposited in this big valley here. You can see it's isolated. It's just one on its own. There's no more granite erratics anywhere near it. Just one isolated granite erratic. And it does have features typical of glacially transported boulders, like a flat, flat faceted edges, sort of rounded, flat surfaces. More pictures of isolated granite boulders. These ones are on high elevations, so they're on the hilltops, these flat topped hills that you have on Jones Ross Island. You can see there's just one white granite boulder among, this, among all that basalt. So just the one white granite boulder. No granite boulders anywhere near, not much else, just one isolated granite boulder. However, in some places, like in coals and passes where you might expect ice flow to be focused, we found multiple granite boulders. So we found patches of them. When I counted all these pebbles, the field system is delighted I said I counted pebbles, he thought I was mad. But when I counted pebbles, 50% of the pebbles around here are granite, compared with 0% of the granite pebbles around here being granite. So you're getting patches of enhanced deposition, where you're getting numbers of granite boulders and granite pebbles being deposited. And then you can see how white this is. It's full of granite. And granite and gneiss and other rocks from Trinity Peninsula. So in some places we get exceptionally high numbers of granite boulders and pebbles being deposited. These are some people for scale. It's a bit fuzzy, but you can see there's some people there. And there's lots and lots of white granite boulders, which you can see all scattered around there. Compare that to these first images that we saw here, just the one scattered isolated boulder. And then in some of these coastal areas, we got uh, pronounced ridges, which are interpreted as moraines. So this is Alan standing on a moraine, and we've got some granite boulders along the crest of that moraine. We took uh, samples of these rocks for this technique called cosmogenic mute flow dating. And you take a kilo of rock, first of all, you get somebody with a strong right arm, they take a kilo of rock, you can really hard these rocks. Um, you Take that back to the lab and you analyse the amount of isotopes that have accumulated in the rock. And the amount of isotopes tells you how long that rock has been exposed in that position. So we can find out how long this rock has been sat in that location. These isotopes don't penetrate us, and they don't penetrate beyond a few centimetres in rock. 
So hopefully, if you've got an age of 10,000 years, that would suggest that that rock has been sat in that location for 10,000 years. Now this is the result that we got. So we've got, what have we got? We've got all our little glaciers in grey, and then we've got modern moraines in this kind of browny colour. And then we've got the cross hatching is the areas with exceptionally high percentages of granite, which is around in here. And then we've got our ages, and the ages are these blue numbers here, so 20, 22.1, 6.3, 6.2. And these ages indicate when this area became ice free. So you've got around 18, 20 years on the high ground, and then from the northern part, you've got it youngs southwards. So we go from 13, 12,000 years, 13,000 years to 7,000 years, younging in this direction. We also have moraines associated with this erratic rich drift. So this is how we interpreted it. We thought that we probably had a two phase glacial cycle. The first phase is associated with the last glacial maximum, the global maximum of ice, and the local maximum of ice. The ice is grounded way out on the continental shelf edge. It's thick, it's slow moving, it's cold, and it overwhelms the local topography, so it completely overwhelms Prince Gustav Channel. And it distributes granite boulders at high elevations around, around the island. We know it's cold because it's not very erosive, there's not very much evidence, it's very subtle, it's just the isolated granite boulders. We then think that as the ice started to thin, it became more constrained by topography. And that's when we started to see ice streaming in Prince Gustav Channel. Ice streams are wet based, they're very erosive, they're very active. And that's why we see enhanced deposition around the margins, the lateral 